This is my Fiat Seicento, and by most people's measure, you might think this is a small car. But it's not really. It's actually some hulking great behemoth that's on a par with today's SUVs. If you want a properly small car, you've got to go to Japan. This is the Honda Beat. After World War II, Japan wanted to mobilise its people as cheaply and efficiently as possible. So it created a whole new class of car, known as K-cars, or K-jadosha to give them their full name. And there were regulations placed very strictly on how long a K-car could be, how wide it could be, how big the engine could be, and how much power it could produce. But the net result was you got very cheap, very compact, very easy and cheap to run and maintain cars, which got more and more benefits added to them as time wore on. As the years wore on, K-cars got tax relief, so they were cheaper to road tax in Japan. They were only allowed in certain areas in the major metropolitan cities in Japan, where bigger cars would simply overcrowd them. And in certain areas where you have to prove you have space to store a car in Japan, otherwise you're not allowed to own one, the K-car was the vehicle of choice. As a result, the class boomed, and within a few decades, most cars in Japan were K-cars. Over time, the K-car regulations grew, so that the cars were still a fraction of the size of a normal car, but they were more competitive and able to be driven longer distances and, of course, faster. By 1990, a K-car had to be no more than 3.3 metres long, 1.4 metres wide, and have an engine of not more than 660cc, producing no more than 63 horsepower, which isn't much even by 1990 standards. Now, of course, you've got lots of practical and spacious, family-friendly little lunchboxes like the Suzuki Wagon R and so on, which really proved popular in Japan, but several manufacturers got creative and thought, can we make fun, sporty cars with this same formula? So Suzuki produced its Cappuccino, Mazda's AutoZam division gave us the mid-engined Ferrari 40-esque AZ1, and then there was Honda, who gave us this, the Beat. From day one, the Beat had a good CV. Honda got Pavel Husek at Pininfarina to design the bodywork. And the net result was a really cool looking little roadster. It's chunky and sporty and aggressive. Looks sort of like a baby NSX from some angles. It's got MR2-esque bits around the middle and little edges of Ferrari here and there. It looks fantastic and particularly in red, this little Tic Tac sports car does draw people's attention. And then there was the engine, which too had elements of NSX to it. Honda don't really do turbochargers, they've only just started embracing them now. So this wasn't going to get a turbo like the Suzuki Cappuccino did. It was going to be naturally aspirated. But what a naturally aspirated engine it was. The EO7A 656cc triple with individual throttle bodies. That's race car stuff for higher flowing induction air and the soundtrack to wake the dead. Oh! Sounds absolutely epic! And even in standard trim, the beat revs out to nearly 9,000 RPM. What's more, the tuning company Mugen produced an ECU for these. Get one of the later ones, and this car revs out to 9,600. But it doesn't go like an NSX, because of course it still had to comply with K-car regulations, and that meant it produces not the 500 million horsepower it sounds like, but 63 horsepower. And even when you factor in a 735 kilo curb weight, this is not a fast car. 0 to 60 takes 13 seconds, and the top speed is 87. So in more ways than just dimensions then, this is more a rival for the likes of the MG Midget than it is the Mazda MX-5 or the BMW Z3. Little tunnel coming up here. You'll forgive me, won't you? <laughs> Don't get that in an MX-5, do you? But it isn't all bark and no clever engineering because this was the era when Honda really put its nous into creating driver's cars. The Beat does use conventional McPherson strut suspension, but it's been set up cleverly. It's not too firmly damped. It's got a little bit of roll to it, which means it's not twitchy and nervous. It's not going to bite you and suddenly snap the tail round, which it otherwise would do with these tyres, which are 175 at the back and 145 profile at the front. I've got bicycle tyres fatter than that. In every other respect, the Beat was actually very cleverly engineered. It was the first ever K-car to have four-wheel disc brakes, and that means oh, it does stop on a dime. And then there's the balance. 
being mid-engined it isn't perfect 50-50 but it is almost perfect and crucially the center of gravity it sits precisely at the base of the driver's back and that means you guessed it this little sports car literally pivots around your backside and it is so much fun for it the steering because there's no weight over it is so responsive it's light fingertip responsive and chuckable you can just fling it around in your lane and here's the thing you can play with it and have fun with it because even if you really go stupid you're in such a tiny car that even on Japanese roads let alone British ones you are nowhere near the white line which means you can have fun you can just enjoy it and you can rev out that little triple and still I'm only doing about 50 miles an hour so you can have huge fun at tiny speeds, just like those little miniature sportsters of old, like the Frog Eye Sprite and the MG Midget. It's so chuckable, this thing. And actually the body roll really helps it because suddenly it doesn't feel like it's gonna bite you like a Caterham does. You can just really get aggressive with it, fling it into a corner. <laughs> oh, it's so good you find yourself just making little twitchy steering wheel movements even when you're going in a straight line just to feel it nip and tuck like an angry little puppy dog. I'm sorry if I'm getting a bit overexcited but I love fun little cars like this and the beat is just... <laughs> it's tremendous fun. And the great thing is you can forever listen to the awesome sound of those ITBs because even if you really rev it out you're not going to be speeding. So all you've got to do is keep your foot in it. 35, 40, really ringing it out now. There's 45, <laughs> yes, so much fun. And it's a convertible. And because it's so tiny and low to the ground, it just feels like you're going a billion miles an hour, especially when you couple it with that NSX-esque soundtrack. And it's driver focused inside as well. You've got this cockpit style dashboard layout like an NSX where it all swoops down, encases you and makes you feel enclosed and like you're in a cockpit. The gear knob is so close to the steering wheel, you don't even need to take your hand off the wheel to touch it. And you've got this tiny little short throw shifter that makes it easy to row the cogs, which you do need to do when you've only got 63 horsepower then there's the gauges they're straight off of a motorbike type layout and you've got a big central rev counter that does indeed redline at 9,000. and if this is all sounding just a little bit too serious and grown up for you i'll draw your attention to the zebra print seats these aren't covers they haven't been re-trimmed the beat came from the factory with zebra print seats in it you can keep your ferrari 355s they don't have that do they what i love most about the beat apart from the noise <laughs> is its ethos. It's got the same fantastic Honda attention to detail and driver focus that you got in cars like the S2000 and the NSX, cars that were winning all kinds of road testers' hearts back in the day. But at a scaled down version, this is this tiny little tic-tac that fits into any parking space you care to mention, that you could almost fit two of in a lane on a standard road, that does over 40 miles to the gallon, even if you drive it like a lunatic. It's got just enough equipment, it's got aircon, electric windows and so on, that means you can use it every day, and yet you can go out and fling around this mid-engine convertible sports car and really rag it, and yet still, oh! You're in no danger of losing your license. I'm still only doing 60 miles an hour. And sure, it's not the most refined car. It rattles, there's a little bit of scuttle shake. The storage is minimal, to say the least. It makes an MR2 look generous. The plastics are a bit 90s Honda-y. And to be honest, while it can do 70 on a motorway, you feel a bit unkind to the poor thing. You're sitting at 5,000 RPM or more. And if you want to overtake, you're going to be changing down and practically pinging it off the limiter just to get past the lorry. So don't go on the motorways then. This really isn't a motorway kind of car. You have to think of it more as a latter-day MG midget, a little sports car that gives you the absolute bare minimum, but offers the maximum amount of fun in return. But you also get Honda reliability and more modern refinements, air conditioning, electric windows, a decent stereo with the cutest little tiny built-in subwoofer between the seats. Think of it then more as what the Frog Eye Sprite or the Midget might have been like had they lived into the 1990s. And suddenly, it makes a whole lot of sense. This little Sportster sold 33,000 cars overall, which 
isn't bad really for a frivolous two-seater sports car that you can hardly drive to the shops and take the kids to school in. And then you consider that these cars only officially sold in Japan. Anyone outside of Japan has been exported. And then it's extremely impressive. And it is a real shame we were denied this car officially, but the Western world has woken up to the beat and hundreds of these cars have been exported. They're available in America. This particular one I'm driving now is for sale through Hobbs Parker Classic Car Auctions. So they've made it to Britain and for about three to five thousand pounds, you can get one of your own. Now that sounds like a lot for not a lot of physical car, but consider first of all, the price of an NSX. And second of all, the fact that a Mint Mark 1 MX-5 can be a 10 grand car these days, and I genuinely don't think it's as fun as this is. So if you're fed up of today's performance cars that are obsessed with having the most amount of power and grip and driver aids and refinement, and they're the size of a luxury car from 20 years ago, if you just want sensations and excitement and enjoyment, but that's friendly on the wallet, that's economical, reliable, and crucially doesn't put your driving license at risk, check out the Honda Beat. You really can't beat it. Ha ha ha! Hunt, 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 hunt